Chapter 22 It takes five years to walk to the elevator. Fifteen more to ride it up. I'm a million years old by the time I walk into my room. Adam is still, silent, perfectly put together, and mechanical in his movements. There's nothing in his eyes, in his limbs, in the motions of his body that indicate he even knows my name. I watch him move quickly, swiftly, carefully around the room, finding the little devices meant to monitor my behavior and disabling them one by one. If anyone asks why my cameras aren't working, Adam won't get in trouble. This order came from Warner. This makes it official. This makes it possible for me to have some privacy. I thought I would need privacy. I'm such a fool. Adam is not the boy I remember. I was in third grade. I'd just moved into town after being thrown out of... Asked to leave my old school. My parents were always moving, always running away from the messes I made, from the playdates I'd ruined, from the friendships I never had. No one ever wanted to talk about my problems, but the mystery surrounding my existence somehow made things worse. The human imagination is often disastrous when left to its own devices. I only heard bits and pieces of their whispers. Freak, did you hear what she did? What a loser. Got kicked out of her old school. Psycho! She's got some kind of disease. No one talked to me. Everyone stared. I was young enough that I still cried. I ate lunch alone by a chain-link fence and never looked in the mirror. I never wanted to see the face everyone hated so much. Girls used to kick me and run away. Boys used to throw rocks at me. I still have scars somewhere. I watched the world pass by through those chain-link fences. I stared out at the cars and the parents dropping off their kids in the moments I'd never be a part of. This was before the diseases became so common that death was a natural part of conversation. This was before we realized the clouds were the wrong color. Before we realized all the animals were dying or infected. Before we realized everyone was going to starve to death. And fast. This was back when we still thought our problems had solutions. Back then, Adam was the boy who used to walk to school. Adam was the boy who sat three rows in front of me. His clothes were worse than mine. His lunch non-existent. I never saw him eat. One morning, he came to school in a car. I know because I saw him being pushed out of it. His father was drunk and driving, yelling and flailing his fists for some reason. Adam stood very still and stared at the ground like he was waiting for something, stealing himself for the inevitable. I watched a father slap his eight-year-old son in the face, I watched Adam fall to the floor, and I stood there, motionless, as he was kicked repeatedly in the ribs. It's all your fault. It's all your fault, you worthless piece of shit. His father screamed over and over and over again, until I threw up right there, all over a patch of dandelions. Adam didn't cry. He stayed curled up on the ground until his father gave up, until he drove away. Only once he was sure everyone was gone did his body break into heaving sobs, his small face smeared into the dirt, his arms clutching at his bruised abdomen. I couldn't look away. I could never get that sound out of my head, that scene out of my head. That's when I started paying attention to Adam Kent. Juliet. I suck in my breath and wish my hands weren't trembling. I wish I had no eyes. Juliet, he says again, this time even softer, and my body is in a blender and I'm made of mush. My bones are aching, aching, aching for his warmth. I won't turn around. You always knew who I was, I whisper. He says nothing. 
and I'm suddenly desperate to see his eyes. I suddenly need to see his eyes. I turn to face him despite everything, only to see he's staring at his hands. I'm sorry, is all he says. I lean back against the wall and press my lids shut. Everything was a performance. Stealing my bed, asking for my name, asking me about my family. He was performing for Warner, for the guards, for whoever was watching. I don't even know what to believe anymore. I need to say it. I need to get it out. I need to rip my wounds open and bleed fresh for him. It's true, I tell him. About the little boy? My voice is shaking so much more than I thought it would. I did that. He's quiet for so long. I never understood before. When I first heard about it, I didn't realize until just now what must have happened. What? I never knew I could blink so much. It never made sense to me, he says, and each word kicks me in the gut. He looks up and looks more agonized than I ever want him to be. When I heard about it, we all heard about it, the whole school. It was an accident, I choke out, failing not to fall apart. He, he fell, and I was trying to help him, and I just, I, I didn't, I, I thought... I know. What? I gasp so loud, I've swallowed the entire room in one breath. I believe you, he says to me. What? Why? My eyes are blinking back tears, my hands unsteady, my heart filled with nervous hope. He bites his bottom lip, looks away, walks to the wall, opens and closes his mouth several times before the words rush out. Because I knew you, Juliet. I... God, I just... He covers his mouth with his hand, drops his fingers to his neck, rubs his forehead, closes his eyes, presses his lips together, pries them open. That was the day I was going to talk to you. A strange sort of smile. A strange sort of laugh. He runs a hand through his hair, looks up at the ceiling, turns his back to me. I was finally going to talk to you. I was finally going to talk to you, and I... He shakes his head hard and attempts another painful laugh. <laughs> God, you don't remember me. Hundreds of thousands of seconds pass and I can't stop dying. I want to laugh and cry and scream and run, and I can't choose which to do first. I confess. Of course I remember you. My voice is a strangled whisper. I squeeze my eyes shut. I remember you every day forever in every single broken moment of my life. You were the only one who ever looked at me like a human being. He never talked to me. He never spoke a single word to me, but he was the only one who dared to sit close to my fence. He was the only one who stood up for me. The only person who fought for me. The only one who'd punch someone in the face for throwing a rock at my head. I didn't even know how to say thank you. He was the closest thing to a friend I ever had. I open my eyes and he's standing right in front of me. My heart is a field of lilies blooming under a pane of glass, pitter-pattering to life like a rush of raindrops. His jaw is as tight as his eyes, as tight as his fists, as tight as the strain in his arms. You've always known. Three whispered words and he's broken my dam, unlocked my lips and stolen my heart all over again. I can hardly feel the tears streaming down my face. Adam! I try to laugh and my lips trip on a stifled sob. I'd recognize your eyes anywhere in the world. And that's it. This time, there's no self-control. This time, I'm in his arms and against the wall and I'm trembling everywhere. And he's so gentle, so careful, touching me like I'm made of porcelain. And I want to shatter. 
He's running his hands down my body, running his eyes across my face, running laps with his heart, and I'm running marathons with my mind. Everything is on fire. My cheeks, my hands, the pit of my stomach, and I'm drowning in waves of emotion and a storm of fresh rain, and all I feel is the strength of his silhouette against mine, and I never, ever, ever, ever want to forget this moment. I want to stamp him into my skin and save him forever. He takes my hands and presses my palms to his face, and I know I never knew the beauty of feeling human before this. I know I'm still crying when my eyes flutter closed. I whisper his name, and he's breathing harder than I am, and suddenly his lips are on my neck, and I'm gasping and dying and clutching at his arms, and he's touching me, touching me, touching me, and I'm thunder and lightning and wondering when the hell I'll be waking up. Once, twice, a hundred times his lips taste the nape of my neck, and I wonder if it's possible to die of euphoria. He meets my eyes only to cup my face in his hands, and I'm blushing through these walls from pleasure and pain and impossibility. I've wanted to kiss you for so long. His voice is husky, uneven, deep in my ear. I'm frozen in anticipation, in expectation, and I'm so worried he'll kiss me, so worried he won't. I'm staring at his lips, and I don't realize how close we are until we're pulled apart. Three distinct electronic screeches reverberate around the room, and Adam looks past me like he can't understand where he is for a moment. He blinks and runs toward an intercom to press the appropriate buttons. I notice he's still breathing hard. I'm shaking in my skin. Name and number, the voice of the intercom demands. Kent, Adam, 45B-86659. A pause. Soldier, are you aware the cameras in your room have been deactivated? Yes, sir. I was given direct orders to dismantle the devices. Who cleared this order? Warner, sir. A longer pause. We'll verify and confirm. Unauthorized tampering with security devices may result in your immediate dishonorable discharge, soldier. I hope you're aware of that. Yes, sir. The line goes quiet. Adam slumps against the wall, his chest heaving. I'm not sure, but I could have sworn his lips twitched into the tiniest smile. He closes his eyes and exhales. I'm not sure what to do with the relief tumbling into my hands. Come here, he says, his eyes still shut. I tiptoe forward and he pulls me into his arms, breathes in the scent of my hair and kisses the side of my head, and I've never felt anything so incredible in my life. I'm not even human anymore. I'm so much more. The sun and the moon have merged, and the earth is upside down. I feel like I can be exactly who I want to be in his arms. He makes me forget the terror I'm capable of. Juliet, he whispers in my ear. We need to get the hell out of here. Chapter 23 I'm 14 years old again, and I'm staring at the back of his head in a small classroom. I'm 14 years old, and I've been in love with Adam Kent for years. I made sure to be extra careful, to be extra quiet, to be extra cooperative because I didn't want to move away again. I didn't want to leave the school with the one friendly face I'd ever known. I watched him grow up a little more every day, grow a little taller every day, a little stronger, a little tougher, a little more quiet every day. He eventually got too big to get beat up by his dad, but no one really knows what happened to his mother. The students shunned him, harassed him until he started fighting back, until the pressure of the world finally cracked him. But his eyes always stayed the same. Always the same when he looked at me, kind, compassionate, desperate to understand, but he never asked questions. He never pushed me to say a word. 
He just made sure he was close enough to scare away everyone else. I thought maybe I wasn't so bad. Maybe. I thought maybe he saw something in me. I thought maybe I wasn't as horrible as everyone said I was. I hadn't touched anyone in years. I didn't dare get close to people. I couldn't risk it. Until one day I did. And I ruined everything. I killed a little boy in a grocery store simply by helping him to his feet. By grabbing his little hands. I didn't understand why he was screaming. It was my first experience ever touching someone for such a long period of time, and I didn't understand what was happening to me. The few times I'd ever accidentally put my hands on someone, I'd always pulled away. I'd pulled away as soon as I remembered I wasn't supposed to be touching anyone, as soon as I heard the first scream escape their lips. The little boy was different. I wanted to help him. I felt such a surge of sudden anger toward his mother for neglecting his cries. Her lack of compassion as a parent devastated me, and it reminded me too much of my own mother. I just wanted to help him. I wanted him to know that someone else was listening, that someone else cared. I didn't understand why it felt so strange and exhilarating to touch him. I didn't know that I was draining his life and I couldn't comprehend why he'd grown limp and quiet in my arms. I thought maybe the rush of power and positive feeling meant that I'd been cured of my horrible disease. I thought so many stupid things and I ruined everything. I thought I was helping. I spent the next three years of my life in hospitals, law offices, juvenile detention centers, and suffered through pills and electroshock therapy. Nothing worked. Nothing helped. Outside of killing me, locking me up in an institution was the only solution. The only way to protect the public from the terror of Juliet. Until he stepped into my cell. I hadn't seen Adam Kent in three years. And he does look different. Tougher, taller, harder, sharper, tattooed. He's muscle, mature, quiet, and quick. It's almost like he can't afford to be soft or slow or relaxed. He can't afford to be anything but muscle, anything but strength and efficiency. The lines of his face are smooth, precise, carved into shape by years of hard living and training and trying to survive. He's not a little boy anymore. He's not afraid. He's in the army. But he's not so different either. He still has the most unusually blue eyes I've ever seen, dark and deep and drenched in passion. I always wondered what it'd be like to see the world through such a beautiful lens, I wondered if your eye color meant you saw the world differently, if the world saw you differently as a result. I should have known it was him when he showed up in my cell. Part of me did, but I'd tried so hard to repress the memories of my past that I refused to believe it could be possible. Because a part of me didn't want to remember. A part of me was too scared to hope a part of me didn't know if it would make any difference to know that it was him after all. I often wonder what I must look like. I wonder if I'm just a punctured shadow of the person I was before. I haven't looked in the mirror in three years. I'm so scared of what I'll see. Someone knocks on the door. I'm catapulted across the room by my own fear. Adam locks eyes with me before opening the door, and I decide to retreat into a far corner of the room. I sharpen my ears only to hear muted voices, hushed tones, and someone clearing his throat. I'm not sure what to do. I'll be down in a minute, Adam says a little loudly. I realize he's trying to end the conversation. Come on, man, I just want to see her. She's not a goddamn spectacle, Kenji. Get the hell out of here. Wait, just tell me. Does she light shit on fire with her eyes?
Kenji laughs and I cringe, slumping to the floor behind the bed. I curl into myself and try not to hear the rest of the conversation. I fail. Adam sighs. I can picture him rubbing his forehead. Just get out. Kenji struggles to muffle his laughter. <laughs> Damn, you're sensitive all of a sudden, huh? Hanging out with a girl is changing you, man. Adam says something I can't hear. The door slams shut. I peek up from my hiding place. Adam looks embarrassed. My cheeks go pink. I study the intricate threads of the finely woven carpet under my feet. I touch the cloth wallpaper and wait for him to speak. I stand up to stare out the small square of a window, only to be met by the bleak backdrop of a broken city. I lean my forehead against the glass. Metal cubes are clustered together off in the distance, compounds housing civilians wrapped in multiple layers, trying to find refuge from the cold. A mother holding the hand of a small child, soldiers standing over them, still like statues, Rifles poised and ready to fire. Heaps and heaps and heaps of trash. Dangerous scraps of iron and steel glinting on the ground. Lonely trees waving at the wind. Adam's hands slip around my waist. His lips are at my ear and he says nothing at all. But I melt until I'm a handful of hot butter dripping down his body. I want to eat every minute of this moment. I allow my eyes to shut against the truth outside my window, just for a little while. Adam takes a deep breath and pulls me even closer. I'm molded to the shape of his silhouette. His hands are circling my waist, and his cheek is pressed against my head. You feel incredible. I try to laugh, but seem to have forgotten how. Those are words I never thought I'd hear. Adam spins me around so I'm facing him, and suddenly I'm looking and not looking at his face. I'm licked by a million flames and swallowing a million more. He's staring at me like he's never seen me before. I want to wash my soul in the bottomless blue of his eyes. He leans in until his forehead rests against mine, and our lips still aren't close enough. He whispers, How are you? And I want to kiss every beautiful beat of his heart. How are you? Three words no one ever asks me. I want to get out of here, is all I can think of. He squeezes me against his chest, and I marvel at the power, the glory, the wonder in such a simple movement. He feels like one block of strength, six feet tall. Every butterfly in the world has migrated to my stomach. Juliet. I lean back to see his face. Are you serious about leaving? He asks me. His fingers brush the side of my cheek. He tucks a stray strand of hair behind my ear. Do you understand the risks? I take a deep breath. I know that the only real risk is death. Yes. He nods, drops his eyes, his voice. The troops are mobilizing for some kind of attack. There have been a lot of protests from groups who were silent before, and our job is to obliterate the resistance. I think they want this attack to be their last one. He adds quietly. There's something huge going on, and I'm not sure what, not yet. But whatever it is, we have to be ready to go when they are. I freeze. What do you mean? When the troops are ready to deploy, you and I should be ready to run. It's the only way out that will give us time to disappear. Everyone will be too focused on the attack. It'll buy us some time before they notice we're missing or can get enough people together to search for us. But you mean you'll come with me? You'd be willing to do that for me? He smiles a small smile. His lips twitch like he's trying not to laugh. His eyes soften as they study my own. There's very little I wouldn't do for you. I take a deep breath 
and close my eyes, touching my fingers to his chest, imagining the bird soaring across his skin, and I ask him the one question that scares me the most. Why? What do you mean? He steps back. Why, Adam? Why do you care? Why do you want to help me? I don't understand. I don't know why you'd be willing to risk your life. But then his arms are around my waist, and he's pulling me so close, and his lips are at my ear, and he says my name once, twice, and I had no idea I could catch on fire so quickly. His mouth is smiling against my skin. You don't? I don't know anything, is what I would tell him if I had any idea how to speak. He laughs a little and pulls back, takes my hand and studies it. Do you remember in fourth grade, he says, when Molly Carter signed up for the school field trip too late? All the spots were filled, and she stood outside the bus crying because she wanted to go. He doesn't wait for me to answer. I remember you got off the bus. You offered her your seat, and she didn't even say thank you. I watched you standing on the sidewalk as we pulled away. I'm no longer breathing. Do you remember in fifth grade, that week Dana's parents nearly got divorced? She came to school every day without her lunch, and you offered to give her yours. He pauses. As soon as that week was over, she went back to pretending you didn't exist. I'm still not breathing. In seventh grade, Shelley Morrison got caught cheating off your math test. She kept screaming that if she failed, her father would kill her. You told the teacher that you were the one cheating off her test. You got a zero on the exam and detention for a week. He lifts his head but doesn't look at me. You had bruises on your arms for at least a month after that. I always wondered where they came from. My heart is beating too fast, dangerously fast. I clench my fingers to keep them from shaking. I lock my jaw in place and wipe my face clean of emotion, but I can't slow the thrumming in my chest no matter how hard I try. A million times, he says, his voice so quiet now. I saw you do things like that a million times, but you never said a word unless it was forced out of you. He laughs again, this time a hard, heavy sort of laugh. He's staring at a point directly past my shoulder. <laughs> you never asked for anything from anyone. He finally meets my eyes. But no one ever gave you a chance. I swallow hard. Try to look away, but he catches my face. He whispers. You have no idea how much I thought about you. How many times I've dreamt. He takes a tight breath. How many times I've dreamt about being this close to you. He moves to run a hand through his hair before he changes his mind. Looks down, looks up. God, Juliet, I'd follow you anywhere. You're the only good thing left in this world. I'm begging myself not to burst into tears, and I don't know if it's working. I'm everything broken and glued back together and blushing everywhere, and I can hardly find the strength to meet his gaze. His fingers find my chin, tip me up. We have three weeks at the most, he says. I don't think they can control the mobs for much longer. I nod. I blink. I rest my face against his chest and pretend I'm not crying. Three weeks... Chapter 24 Two weeks pass. Two weeks of dresses and showers and food I want to throw across the room. Two weeks of Warner smiling and touching my waist, laughing and guiding the small of my back, making sure I look my best as I walk beside him. He thinks I'm his trophy, his secret weapon. I have to stifle the urge to crack his knuckles into concrete but I offer him two weeks of cooperation because in one week we'll be gone, hopefully. 
But then, more than anything else, I've found I don't hate Warner as much as I thought I did. I feel sorry for him. He finds a strange sort of solace in my company. He thinks I can relate to him and his twisted notions, his cruel upbringing, his absent and simultaneously demanding father. But he never says a word about his mother. Adam says that no one knows anything about Warner's mother, that she's never been discussed and no one has any idea who she is. He says that Warner is only known to be the consequence of ruthless parenting and a cold, calculated desire for power. He hates happy children and happy parents and their happy lives. I think Warner thinks that I understand, that I understand him. And I do, and I don't, because we're not the same. I want to be better. Adam and I have little time together but nighttime, and even then not so much. Warner watches me more closely every day. Disabling the cameras only made him more suspicious. He's always walking into my room unexpectedly, taking me on unnecessary tours around the building, talking about nothing but his plans, and his plans to make more plans, and how together we'll conquer the world. I don't pretend to care. Maybe it's me who's making this worse. I can't believe Warner actually agreed to get rid of your cameras, Adam said to me one night. He's insane. He's not rational. He's sick in a way I'll never understand. Adam sighed. He's obsessed with you. What? I nearly snapped my neck in surprise. You're all he ever talks about. Adam was silent a moment, his jaw too tight. I heard stories about you before you even got here. That's why I got involved. It's why I volunteered to go get you. Warner spent months collecting information about you. Addresses, medical records, personal histories, family relations, birth certificates, blood tests. The entire army was talking about his new project. Everyone knew he was looking for a girl who killed a little boy in a grocery store a girl named Juliet. I held my breath. Adam shook his head. I knew it was you. It had to be. I asked Warner if I could help with the project. I told him I'd gone to school with you, that I'd heard about the little boy, that I'd seen you in person. He laughed a hard laugh. <laughs> Warner was thrilled. He thought it would make the experiment more interesting. He added, disgusted. And I knew that if he wanted to claim you as some kind of sick project... He hesitated, looked away, ran a hand through his hair. I just knew I had to do something. I thought I could try to help. But now it's gotten worse. Warner won't stop talking about what you're capable of or how valuable you are to his efforts and how excited he is to have you here. Everyone is beginning to notice. Warner is ruthless. He has no mercy for anyone. He loves the power, the thrill of destroying people. But he's starting to crack, Juliet. He's so desperate to have you join him. And for all his threats, he doesn't want to force you. He wants you to want it, to choose him in a way. He looked down, took a tight breath. He's losing his edge. And whenever I see his face, I'm always about two inches away from doing something stupid. I'd love to break his jaw. Yes, Warner is losing his edge. He's paranoid, though with good reason. But then he's patient and impatient with me, excited and nervous all the same time. He's a walking oxymoron. He disables my cameras, but some nights he orders Adam to sleep outside my door to make sure I don't escape. He says I can eat lunch alone, but always ends up summoning me to his side. The few hours Adam and I would have had together are stolen from us, but the fewer nights Adam is allowed to sleep inside my room, I manage to spend huddled in his arms. We both sleep on the floor now, 
wrapped up in each other for warmth, even with the blanket covering our bodies. Every time he touches me, it's like a burst of fire and electricity that ignites my bones in the most amazing way. It's the kind of feeling I wish I could hold in my hand. Adam tells me about new developments, whispers he's heard around the other soldiers. He tells me how there are multiple headquarters across what's left of the country, how Warner's dad is at the Capitol, how he's left his son in charge of this entire sector. He says Warner hates his father, but loves the power, the destruction, the devastation. He strokes my hair and tells me stories and tucks me close like he's afraid I'll disappear. He paints pictures of people and places until I fall asleep. Until I'm drowning in a drug of dreams to escape a world with no refuge, no relief, no release but his reassurances in my ear. Sleep is the only thing I look forward to these days. I can hardly remember why I used to scream. Things are getting too comfortable, and I'm beginning to panic. Put these on, Warner says to me. Breakfast in the blue room has become routine. I eat and don't ask where the food comes from, whether or not the workers are being paid for what they do, how this building manages to sustain so many lives, pump so much water, or use so much electricity. I bide my time now. I cooperate. Warner hasn't asked me to touch him again, and I don't offer. What are they for? I eye the small pieces of fabric in his hands and feel a nervous twinge in my gut. He smiles a slow, sneaky smile. An aptitude test. He grabs my wrist and places the bundle in my hand. I'll turn around, just this once. I'm almost too nervous to be disgusted by him. My hands shake as I change into the outfit that turns out to be a tiny tank top and tinier shorts. I'm practically naked. I'm practically convulsing in fear of what this might mean. I clear my throat just the tiniest bit and Warner spins around. He takes too long to speak. His eyes are busy traveling the road map of my body. I want to rip up the carpet and sew it to my skin. He smiles and offers me his hand. I'm granite and limestone and marbled glass. I don't move. He drops his hand. He cocks his head. Follow me. Warner opens the door. Adam is standing outside. He's gotten so good at masking his emotions that I hardly register the look of shock that shifts in and out of his features. Nothing but the strain in his forehead, the tension in his temples, gives him away. He knows something's not right. He actually turns his head to take in my appearance. He blinks. Sir, remain where you are, soldier. I'll take it from here. Adam doesn't answer, doesn't answer, doesn't answer. Yes, sir, he says, his voice suddenly hoarse. I feel his eyes on me as I turn down the hall. Warner takes me somewhere new. We're walking through corridors I've never seen, blacker and bleaker and more narrow as we go. I realize we're heading downward. Into a basement. We pass through one, two, four metal doors. Soldiers everywhere, their eyes everywhere, appraising me with both fear and something else I'd rather not consider. I've realized there are very few females in this building. If there were ever a place to be grateful for being untouchable, it'd be here. It's the only reason I have asylum from the praying eyes of hundreds of lonely men. It's the only reason Adam is staying with me. Because Warner thinks Adam is a cardboard cutout of vanilla regurgitations. He thinks Adam is a machine oiled by orders and demands. He thinks Adam is a reminder of my past, and he uses it to make me uncomfortable. He'd never imagine Adam could lay a finger on me. No one would. Everyone I meet is absolutely petrified. 
The darkness is like a black canvas punctured by a blunt knife, with beams of light peeking through. It reminds me too much of my old cell. My skin ripples with uncontrollable dread. I'm surrounded by guns. In you go, Warner says. I'm pushed into an empty room smelling faintly of mold. Someone hits a switch and fluorescent lights flicker on to reveal pasty yellow walls and carpet the color of dead grass. The door slams shut behind me. There's nothing but cobwebs and a huge mirror in this room. The mirror is half the size of the wall. Instinctively, I know Warner and his accomplices must be watching me. I just don't know why. There are secrets everywhere. There are answers nowhere. Mechanical clinks, cracks, creaks, and shifts shake the space I'm standing in. The ground rumbles to life. The ceiling trembles with the promise of chaos. Metal spikes are suddenly everywhere, scattered across the room, puncturing every surface at all different heights. Every few seconds they disappear, only to reappear with a sudden jolt of terror, slicing through the air like needles. I realize I'm standing in a torture chamber. Static and feedback from speakers older than my dying heart crackle to life. I'm a racehorse galloping toward a false finish line, breathing hard for someone else's gain. Are you ready? Warner's amplified voice echoes around the room. What am I supposed to be ready for? I yell into the empty space, certain that someone can hear me. I'm calm, I'm calm, I'm calm. I'm petrified. We had a deal, remember? The room responds. What? I disabled your cameras. Now it's your turn to hold up your end of the bargain. I won't touch you! I shout, spinning in place, terrified, horrified, worried I might faint at any moment. That's all right, he says. I'm sending in my replacement. The door squeals open, and a toddler waddles in, wearing nothing but a diaper. He's blindfolded and hiccuping sobs, shuddering in fear. One pin pops my entire existence into nothing. If you don't save him, Warner's words crackle through the room, we won't either. This child. He must have a mother, a father, someone who loves him. This child, this child, this child stumbling forward in terror. He could be speared through by a metal stalagmite at any second. Saving him is simple. I need to pick him up, find a safe spot of ground, and hold him in my arms until the experiment is over. There's only one problem. If I touch him, he might die. Chapter 25 Warner knows I don't have a choice. He wants to force me into another situation where he can see the impact of my abilities, and he has no problem torturing an innocent child to get exactly what he wants. Right now, I have no options. I have to take a chance before this little boy steps forward in the wrong direction. I quickly memorize as much as I can of the traps and dodge, hop, narrowly avoid the spikes until I'm as close as possible. I take a deep, shaky breath and focus on the shivering limbs of the boy in front of me and pray to God I'm making the right decision. I'm about to pull off my shirt to use as a barrier between us when I notice the slight vibration in the ground, the tremble that precedes the terror. I know I have half of a second before the spikes slice up through the air and even less time to react. I yank him up and into my arms. His screams pierce through me like I'm being shot to death, one bullet for every second. He's clawing at my arms, my chest, kicking my body as hard as he can, crying out in agony until the pain paralyzes him. He goes weak in my grip, 
and I'm being ripped to pieces, my eyes, my bones, my veins, all tumbling out of place, all turning on me to torture me forever with memories of the horrors I'm responsible for. Pain and power are bleeding through his body into mine, jolting through his limbs and crashing into me until I nearly drop him. It's like reliving a nightmare I've spent three years trying to forget. Absolutely amazing. Warner sighs through the speakers and I realize I was right. He must be watching through a two-way mirror. Brilliant, love. I'm thoroughly impressed. I'm too desperate to be able to focus on Warner right now. I have no idea how long this sick game is going to last, and I need to lessen the amount of skin I'm exposing to this little boy's body. My skimpy outfit makes so much sense now. I rearrange him in my arms and manage to grab hold of his diaper. I'm holding him up with the palm of my hand. I'm desperate to believe I couldn't have touched him long enough to cause serious damage. He hiccups once. His body quivers back to life. I could cry from happiness. But then, the screams start back up again, no longer cries of torture but of fear. He's desperate to get away from me, and I'm losing my grip, my wrist nearly breaking from the effort. I don't dare remove his blindfold. I'd rather die than allow him to see this space, to see my face. I clench my jaw so fast I'm afraid I'm going to break my teeth. If I put him down, he'll start running. And if he starts running, he's finished. I have to keep holding on. The roar of an old mechanical wheeze revives my heart. The spikes slip back into the ground one by one until they've all disappeared. The room is harmless again so swiftly I fear I may have imagined the danger. I drop the boy back onto the floor and bite down on my lip to swallow the pain welling in my wrist. The child starts running and accidentally bumps my bare legs. He screams and shudders and falls to the floor, curled up into himself, sobbing until I consider destroying myself, ridding myself of this world. Tears are streaming fast down my face, and I want nothing more than to reach out to him and help him, hug him close, kiss his beautiful cheeks, and tell him I'll take care of him forever, that we'll run away together, that I'll play games with him and read him stories at night, and I know I can't. I know I never will. I know it will never be possible. And suddenly the world shifts out of focus. I am overcome by a rage, an intensity, an anger so potent I'm almost elevated off the ground. I'm boiling with blind hatred and disgust. I don't even understand how my feet move in the next instant. I don't understand my hands and what they're doing or how they decided to fly forward, fingers splayed, charging toward the window. I only know I want to feel Warner's neck snap between my own two hands. I want him to experience the same terror he just inflicted upon a child. I want to watch him die. I want to watch him beg for mercy. I catapult through the concrete walls. I crush the glass with ten fingers. I'm clutching a fistful of gravel and a fistful of fabric at Warner's neck, and there are fifty different guns pointed at my head. The air is heavy with cement and sulfur, the glass falling in an agonized symphony of shattered hearts. I slam Warner into the corroded stone. Don't you dare shoot her. Warner wheezes at the guards. I haven't touched his skin yet, but I have the strangest suspicion that I could smash his ribcage into his heart if I just pressed a little harder. I should kill you. My voice is one deep breath, one uncontrolled exhalation. You, he tries to swallow. You just, you just broke through concrete with your bare hands. I blink. I don't dare look behind me, but I know without looking backward that he can't be lying. I must have. My mind is a maze of impossibility. I lose focus for one instant. The guns, 
click, click, click. Every moment is loaded. If any of you hurt her, I will shoot you myself, Warner barks. But sir, stand down, soldier. The rage is gone. The sudden uncontrollable anger is gone. My mind has already surrendered to disbelief, confusion. I don't know what I've done. I obviously don't know what I'm capable of, because I had no idea I could destroy anything at all. And I'm suddenly so terrified, so terrified, so terrified of my own two hands. I stumble backward, stunned, and catch Warner watching me hungrily, eagerly, his emerald eyes bright with boyish fascination. He's practically trembling in excitement. There's a snake in my throat, and I can't swallow it down. I meet Warner's gaze. If you ever put me in a position like that again, I will kill you. And I will enjoy it. I don't even know if I'm lying.